this is Carl from Nile, and you're listening to Metal Wani. Hello, Mr. Carl Sanders. How are you doing? Doing fine. And you, sir? I'm doing great. First of all, greetings from India. I would like to start on a very simple note. What does death metal mean to you? Uh, death metal is my life. Uh, mm-hmm. I've given my entire, uh, you know, life since I was, you know, a, a musician uh, mm-hmm. as an adult to playing metal. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I live it. I breathe it. I get up every day. That's who I am. It's what I do. Wonderful. So the day starts with death metal and the day ends with death metal. And there's some death metal in between. (laughs) Wonderful. In terms of music, uh, lyrics, as well as the concept and how they are created, what is the creative process behind a Nile song for you? Well, generally, Nile songs start with the lyrics. uh, Okay. And uh, usually once that happens, uh, Mm -hmm. uh, either Dallas or I will... We'll take those lyrics and, uh, you know, come up with riffs and musical ideas okay. to more or less bring those lyrics to life mm-hmm. or rebirth or reanimation. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, so you basic, basically, you know, you write a specific riff to capture an image or a scene which is there in your mind. Exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh and we use those lyrics as like a guideline in, you know, putting them to music together. Kind of like a script, uh-huh. you know, for a movie. You know, we so sometimes the lyrics will, you know, take you down paths you wouldn't normally have thought of if you were just in the band room, you know, bashing out like most bands do, they go, Oh, I got a riff mm-hmm. and hey, I got a bass part and you just throw it in the soup and you know, you get something. Right. But the way we do it it's uh, it's a very creatively liberating kind of process because mm-hmm. you're just trying to bring the lyrics to life without preconceived restrictions. Right. So uh, generally, I mean, this is surprising for me uh, that the song starts with lyrics. In general, uh, most of the musicians' uh, approach, their approach is basically to wind up the music first and then start writing lyrics. Um, yeah, that's how most bands do it. And... Uh, I certainly did that, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, uh-huh. but I, I found with doing the lyrics first, mm-hmm. it uh, exploded many possibilities for creativity that would have never occurred had we did it the normal way in the band room. Right. Now, that's great. So, Niles, Niles you know, the entire uh, script, like you mentioned, is basically most of the time based on the ancient civilizations and Egypt in, in particular. So when you think about uh, an album, I mean, when you do a research about what are you going to write for the new album, how much time does it basically take for you? Uh, usually quite a while, because to write the lyrics that I'm, I'm happy with, it's uh, it's not necessarily an easy challenge. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Because uh, if it's too normal, then it's, it's not going to be right or Nile, in, to actually frame ancient history and ancient civilizations mm-hmm. in lyrics that are appropriate for the death metal genre, mm-hmm. it's actually quite a challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, so sometimes it takes a while to write the lyrics. I remember uh, there was one record that I spent like a year wow. writing lyrics for. So it uh, basically, sometimes you must have written something which, you know, lyrically or conceptually, which uh, you know, you found out doesn't apply for Nile, or let's say you felt that would be inaccurate. So has that sort of uh, you know incident happened with you? Uh, yeah, it, usually I I either give those songs to somebody else or the, throw them away or uh, incorporate uh, them into your solo stuff as well. Uh, not so much mm-hmm. uh, with that. Uh, I, I know I saw a thing online where, uh, like Wikipedia, where they said that's what I did, but no, it, it doesn't really happen. I, I know as soon as I start uh, writing a piece, if it's going to be right for my solo record mm-hmm. or not. Um, 
So it's it's not it's definitely not Nile cast offs on my solo record. It's right. stuff uh, born of an an entirely different sort of thing. Yeah, the different frame of mind. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right, I agree with that. Now, keeping your interest in ancient civilization in mind, uh, I like the way you guys come up with the song titles. Uh, those things are quite interesting. But when it comes to instrumentals. Is it easier or difficult, you know, to come up with the song titles for those songs? Uh, that's actually kind of fun, I mm -hmm. think, because um, mm -hmm. the song title just kind of you know reflects whatever the instrumental made me think of. Mm -hmm. um, like there was one on the uh, the new record uh, called "Slaves of Zool." Right. Uh, it uh, it reminded me of like. Uh, you know, slaves being whipped, mm -hmm. and also kind of uh, like our former bass player and, and good friend John Bazzano of mm -hmm. uh, John Bazzano inside a refrigerator as a little demon, uh -huh. like going nuts and running around. So right. I, you know, I just came up with a title, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of like made me think of that, you know. So it's a very organic kind of process. Right. You know, it's it's not not trickery. It's just you know where. It, ever it leaves my brain well okay that's mm -hmm. good enough right right that, that's quite cool so you know band started almost two decades ago but in 80s as well as in early 90s death metal bands like death morbid angel and even cannibal corpse were rebelling against the motley crews of the world <laughs> and were actually raising the bar in death metal community so you know what kind of change have you seen in the death metal scene since you started out I've seen it become, I think, very watered down in, in spirit. Uh, okay. Like you said, uh, 20, 25 years ago, there was a great spirit of rebellion. Yes. If you loved death metal, then you hated everything else. <laughs> right. And you totally embraced death metal and said, fuck you to everyone else. True. And there was a certain bond that uh, metal fans all shared because we were all rebelling so thoroughly against everything else. Right. But in recent years, it's become okay to like death metal. Mm -hmm. It's become more acceptable. And with that acceptance, uh, now it's no longer, you know, such a forbidden evil thing to listen to death metal. It's, it's okay. If your mom and dad listen to death metal, well, mm -hmm. then how bad could it be? <laughs> That's true. What are the bands uh, right now in, in, in the current death metal scene which you feel are really shining out? I mean, musically, yeah, they're shining out. Wow. Um, you know, I, I like stuff like Immolation, uh, the, the new Gorguts. Right. Uh, Chrysian has is, is been doing like incredibly brutal things. They're such an underrated band in the big picture of things, but in reality, they are, I think, the most brutal band on the planet. Mm-hmm. So, um, uh, I also saw a band, uh, uh, I guess a few weeks ago at the NAM convention, uh -huh. uh, with uh, Alex Webster, right. Cannibal Corpse, Jeff Conquering, Lewis. Conquering Dystopia. Yeah. Oh, yes, my friend. What mm -hmm. an incredible, incredible band. They are the evolution mm -hmm. of extreme death metal. What a progression. I uh, you know what? I had a chat with Alex Webster yesterday morning regarding that. Uh, he, wow. said he was telling me about that. It. It's a very interesting project. Uh, they had the audience spellbound mm -hmm. at uh, the Grove in Anaheim. There were, I, I would say, 700, 800 people watching them. Um, at NAMM. We were all captivated mm -hmm. from the first note to the last note. Wonderful. So it's great to see that. They're still death metal fans, which which are under your era that they're doing really good. So yes. if, if we travels back to the 80s, I remember my friends telling me how the underground scene was. I mean, there was no internet; it was all about tapes. So if we, you know, keep that in mind, there was a real underground scene that time. So there was yes. no, no downloads, you know, nothing at all. Everybody used to distribute tapes, so there was that passion of having that one tape in your hand. Yes, Compared. yes, it was a thrill. It mm -hmm. was a, like a hidden thrill, like, you know, you were Indiana Jones discovering a, a lost treasure. Mm -hmm. It was that kind of thrill. Right, but 
what do you how, how do you you know see that particular two decades ago how it was and how it's now well you know i i i really enjoyed how it used to be because there was an appreciation mm -hmm. like there was a value placed upon the music mm -hmm. nowadays everything is so easily downloadable and it's free right. it's music and death metal in particular has mm -hmm. become devalued it has no value mm -hmm. it's easy to get it's easy to throw away there's 10,000 metal bands um, right. and it's probably out of those 10,000 mm -hmm. 9,000 fucking suck uh, <laughs> So, yeah, I, I think music has become devalued. Mm -hmm. Devalued. It, you know, it used to, there was a lot more involved mm -hmm. in acquiring a piece of music. And because it cost you something, right. your time, you had to wait, you had to spend your money, or you traded with somebody, you had to wait on the mail to get there. Mm -hmm. So maybe it was a month or two months before you got that tape that you were hoping to get. Um, there was value placed on it. You know, once you got it, you had a fucking treasure. Yeah. You were like, yeah. It was like the, you know, the, the, the gift, which is irreplaceable. The moment yes, will be in your right. mind. Yes. Uh, but the things have changed. So, you know, look at the album sales of any particular artist. Let's say death metal. Uh, it's, it's drastically come down every year and it's going to continue, I guess. I, I see it continuing to go down. Um, but there are pockets of the world where people still support metal. Right. Um, thank God for those people and those places. <laughs> or thank Satan or thank whoever you want to thank. But thank somebody that there are enough fans that care enough to still buy CDs and go to shows and buy T-shirts. Because without those fans keeping metal alive, metal would die. They'd die. Absolutely true. Now, you have George Colias, you know, in your band. You know, as a person, okay, we know he's a drum machine, but as a person, how is it like, you know, you know, when you guys write music, so does he involve his ideas as well, or it's just you and Todd sit and compose the tunes? Well, generally, since uh, George lives in Athens, Greece, mm -hmm. um, when Dallas and I write songs, we make demos, and we send them to George, and, and he works on his parts and his ideas at home. Mm -hmm. uh, and then once we've done all that, mm -hmm. and we feel kind of good about the songs, then we get together, George flies over, mm -hmm. and we go in the rehearsal room for a month or six weeks or whatever. Right. We play the songs and work out all the little bugs and uh, you know see where we can take it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I'd say def definitely George does have uh, a considerable input into the songs. Uh, certainly he you know, is the drummer since Pete Amora, our original drummer, right. had the most input on songwriting. That, that, that's cool. But, you know, if you talk about the bass players, uh, you know, I personally as a fan feel that your previous bass players have let you down. Uh, well, I would agree with that. Yeah. So keeping in mind how they have changed over the period of, you know, so many years, it's kind of become unpredictable. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think you guys are able to figure out who's going to stay permanent. I know. It's it's a, a great source of misery for us. Uh, yeah. Um, How's Todd in that sense? Well, Todd seems to be a person driven to less drama. He's, okay. he's a quiet sort of person. Mm -hmm. He doesn't uh, cause a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. um, I think sometimes it seems with very talented people, mm -hmm. they often have eccentric personalities that Absolutely. go along with their extreme talent. And right. sometimes that makes for a lot of drama and you know high tension and like crazy things to happen because there's so much electricity. True. But Todd is very low-key. Mm -hmm. He's very relaxed. Um, he doesn't cause problems. Okay. Um, in fact, that was one of the reasons that we chose him was because he we knew he would not give us headaches. Okay. He would, <laughs> he would do his job 
-hmm. and be solid and dependable and uh -huh. we would not have to worry. All right. So, you know, can we call him as a permanent member now, you know, keeping in mind how things have been going smoothly? Uh, no, we don't call him a permanent uh, <laughs> member. He's still okay. uh, on salary. He's definitely a, a hired hand. Okay. But, you know, maybe if he sticks around long enough, then uh, we'll see. We'll see. Right. I agree with that. Now, where do you think Niles currently fits in with the metal scene generally? Are you still technically part of the metal underground? Uh, I'm not saying you guys are mainstream, but you have proven that extreme metal can do well commercially. Well, we still uh, think of ourselves as an underground band. We, we have the heart and soul of an underground band. Mm -hmm. um, but we work enough to earn a living doing it, okay. um, which is no easy job, my friend. Right, that absolutely. is like you know a Hercules amount of labor mm -hmm. to earn a living playing death metal. I think sure. they should give us an award <laughs> for uh, working incredibly hard. But you know, that's not the way the world works. Um, um, there are other hard-working bands. Uh, you know, immediately springs to mind Cannibal Corpse, Behemoth. Right. right. Uh, those guys work fucking hard too. I mean, fuck. What, Holy shit. What about Obituary? Obituary. Well, they're uh, friends of mine. I know them. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can't say that they work as hard as Cannibal Corpse. Cannibal Corpse right. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. And what do you think about the Kickstarter campaigns these days? The bands are doing. Uh, Obituary did one for their upcoming album, and you know it was a major success. Keeping in mind how the record labels have, you know, and the scene currently is. So, do, does Nile have a plan of doing something like that in future? Um, we're just resigned another deal with Nuclear Blast, yes, yes, so yes. Uh, no. But I have to say that uh, that's an incredible idea mm -hmm. because it it makes the union between the band and the, and the fan. Right. That's the prime importance. The money goes directly between them. True. And therefore, it's it's a true union. It's like earth and water. Right. You know. Right. Uh, it's perfect. And I think that's ideally the way it should be. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Although... One thing it does not allow for is younger bands. Right. If you're a younger band, right, you need the record company to grow you. True. Because if no one knew who Obituary was mm -hmm. and did not love them, right. would nobody would pay. Them? Nobody would pay. True. So, in one hand, it does something beautiful. On the other hand... It's a dagger in the heart of the future of right. young bands. True. Like, if we keep that in mind, basically, now, the record companies have made sure that uh, since the album sales are low, uh, like, do the bands make money by touring? Because that seems to be the primary source. And even there, while touring, there's a lot of sharing between the label and the band. You know, you're right. There's very little, if any, money to be made on records. Most bands are losing money on their records. Right. The only money you can hope to make is on tour, but that's not easy money. Mm -hmm. uh, if you even make money, most bands lose money on tour as well. Okay. Because um, touring is not cheap. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, your biggest cost is you know fuel in the tour bus. Right. Diesel fuel is very expensive. Um, yeah, so... Nightmare. <laughs> nightmare for bands. Yeah, it is a nightmare. Uh, I think our industry is in a state of flux, where right. things changing from the way they used to be into something that no one knows what it will be yet. Right. And during this time of transition, uh, a, lot of, a lot of bands are experiencing the worst part of it mm -hmm. because you know how do you keep going when you're losing money, money right. you can't if you're a professional musician then you depend on your musical work mm -hmm. to pay for your your house your food your electricity the clothes on your children's uh, 
person's the shoes on right. your children's feet. Right. You know, so if you're losing money, then you're fucked. Absolutely. You cannot continue. Right. So, you know, it's it's a great challenging time for bands right now. Right, that's true. Now, it's been more than two decades, uh, you know, and Nile still continues to annihilate fans. Uh, in the course of two decades, was there a moment where you felt, you know, are you tempted to stop with Nile? Uh, there was a moment, uh, you know, when Peter Mora hurt his shoulder years ago, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, it was a very sad time um, because Peter Mora and I had spent you know, a decade before Nile, playing okay. in bands and trying to do something, and we spent years building up Nile, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it, it really felt like, you know, I was losing my brother, yeah. uh, in effect I was, um, but we decided to keep going, um, and I'm glad we did, um, I think... It's about perseverance. Sometimes right. you have to keep going when everything seems black. Yes. Everything seems like it's going to crash over and crush. Yeah. Then that is when you must dig in and fight even harder. True. Uh, in the end, it was fruitful. A good decision. I hope so. Yeah, that, that sure is. <laughs> now, if you get a, you know, if you could travel back in time and you know offer advice to yourself when you started Nile two decades ago, what would it be? I would say, do not listen to critics. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I would say that. Uh, they have given me more pain and anguish uh -huh. over the years. And uh, time has proven them to be wrong. Mm -hmm. And I should have never listened to anything they had to fucking say. Okay. Now, in the past few years, there has been a backlash against technical death metal. Now, you're aware of that. So, there's this return of old school death metal. How do you feel about that? I love it. Mm -hmm. um, I personally prefer to listen to music before all music was recorded on computers. Okay. When music was recorded on tape machines yeah, years analog. ago, analog, bands had to actually play their own music. Mm -hmm. I know that seems like a, a heresy <laughs> right. and an insane concept, but in the years when bands had to actually play their own music to get it on tape, you right. had to be good. You had to practice. You had to work hard. Mm -hmm. And you can hear that if you listen for it in the music. You can hear the soul. Okay. You can hear the fire of the person playing the music because mm -hmm. you had to get it right when you were playing it. You right. couldn't edit it 10,000 times in the computer. True. That was unheard of. You had to actually be able to play it. Um, so I think there's something to that, you know. There's, there's something It's a in, different feeling. Yeah. It's... In, with modern technology, you can record things and, and make them incredibly beautiful and easy to hear right uh, with today's technology you can record a band with unprecedented clarity and precision true so the but mm -hmm. there just is some spiritual thing that I think that's lost mm -hmm. uh, when you edit something 10,000 times. times right uh, that that feeling that you know a band has when they've practiced for months and months and months to get a song as good as they can, mm -hmm. you can feel that soul, that that uh, spirit, spirit that's right. in the music. You can fucking hear it. It's real. It is something. It does exist. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when you chop it up ten thousand times in the computer, you damage that spirit. You damage Absolutely. that soul. Right. I agree with that. Now, uh, this, it's, it's a very simple question I'm going to ask you right now because you go, you've been on stage for so many years, so many decades. But how does it feel right now? You know, you're on stage and you guys are, you know, annihilating and you see a sea of cell phones and cameras taking photographs and videos. Now, gone are the days when you used to see horns. 
He's in there. <laughs> so how does it you feel? Know, there, there's something to that, and 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 I want to. I'm glad you asked that because this is something I, I think we should share with with fans because I don't think fans realize. Mm -hmm. But when you're taking your phone, your cell phone, or your video camera, or whatever it is, and you're busy filming the show, mm -hmm. you are not in the show. Right. You are no longer a part of the experience. When people are involved in the show, mm -hmm. when you're listening to the band, you're watching the band, you're... you're fist is there, you're head banging, right. you're moshing, you're involved, then you're part of a singular community experience. All right. of us are focused on the same energy. Right. And that's an incredible experience and, and you can feel that. It's real. And you you know, the band and the fans, they they unite. They're they're together. There's a, there's a connection on stage as well as when the fans are present. Yes, exactly. So when I see people out there, you know, with their cell phones, texting or, you know, filming the show right. or whatever, they're missing out on an incredible, wonderful live experience that they could be part of. Mm -hmm. And that hurts me. That discourages me. Um, you know, what if you were in bed with your girlfriend and you're making love with her and, you know, she's texting? Well... <laughs> What an example! <laughs> What can I say? Yeah, it it really makes sense. So it's basically annoying. I mean, it, how does it feel? I mean, you're on you're on stage. You're you're just giving your you know two hundred percent, and you see so many cell phones. I mean, is it kind of discouraging to some extent? Yes, it is. Uh, in fact, it bothers me so much that if people do it right in front of me, mm -hmm. I will take their cell phones from them. Okay. If, If they're going to like stick a, a camera or a cell phone camera or a video camera right in my face, I'd say, fuck you, go away. Go 20 feet back. Right. Because that place right in the front, that should be for someone who wants really to. wants to be at the show, who right, wants right. to be involved. Sure. And if you're texting or whatever, you're cheating that fan out mm. of a place where he could be enjoying music. Right, right. I agree with that. Well, we spoke about it, but what about the new Nile album? When are you guys planning to work on it, or has it already started? Um, I've already written two songs, uh, mm -hmm. demoed them out, um, mm -hmm. so the process is kind of underway. Uh, okay. Probably it, Nile album won't be out until you know very late in the year. So... Yeah towards let's say the later states of 2014 exactly okay uh and what about coming to india i mean george has come to india for a clinic last year so he must have told you something about india <laughs> <laughs> yes he he said how incredible the the fans were um mm -hmm. that was the main thing he talked about okay. um which i i can believe that um Uh, I I am looking forward to the day when the entire band can come to India and, and play and, and meet the fans. But it was disappointing because you were supposed to come in 2012. It didn't happen. Yes, uh, that really was very uh, heartbreaking and angering. We uh, we applied for our visa eight fucking times mm -hmm. and were denied eight times with no explanation. Oh. We have had a tough time with visas as well. Uh, you know, I stood last year. They came. Mm -hmm. Previous year, they tried. They couldn't come because of visa. So yep. it's it's really been a horrible time for pants because the last moment things and, you know, they apply for n number of times. It unfortunately doesn't turn up. And it ends up hurting fans because they were eagerly looking forward to that. Uh, I agree wholeheartedly. Yes, sir. So 2014, uh, now since the album is coming out later, maybe early 2015? Yes, yes, exactly, my friend. So we'll have an honor to catch you guys live. It's been, <laughs> I mean, come on, I mean, we've seen George and it was like, the other guys are here, let them tear the stage apart. It's going to be a different experience for us. It will be a great experience. We will all unite in the spirit of metal.
Absolutely. Well, Carl, thank you so much for spending your precious time today. It's been an honor. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, my friend. Have a great day.